Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about this book, which I recently finally finished um, reading, um, Love by the Book by Carolyn James. This is the third and final book, at least um, so far, in her Ladies of Summer Hill historical um, romance series. These are also um, Christian historical romances, which is a subgenre I had never read before, and I was really pleasantly surprised. I ended up, you know, like really liking it. I had absolutely no expectations of what this genre was like going in, although as many reviewers mentioned, and as I myself felt as I like really early on in this book, it really didn't seem to measure up to the previous two, um, Love on Assignment and Love on a Dime, which I absolutely love those books. They were like page turners. I read the, um, the, the second book was the Love on Assignment was the first book, which I read and I like wolf that one down in a day. I read the first chapter in one night and then the very next day I read the entire rest of it. And the first book, um, Love on a Dime. I read that in a couple of days. In this book, it's just like I was putting it aside for like a week or more at a time. Sometimes it's a library book. So like, and I obviously had to finish it before it went back, but I'm really glad I stayed with it after about, I would say like page 200 or so. It finally really, really, you know, started amping up. So like, this is one of those books, if you're like, you know, disappointed, it's slow moving, just, you know, stick with it and it'll eventually get much, much better. But I do agree with the reviewers who felt that it was just wasn't like you know paced or plotted properly like maybe she could have the, the author could have cut out like some of the fluff in the first half of the book and just like like either like you know tightened it up or like moved a lot of the action that happens in the last hundred pages or so a little bit forward and just like done different different things with you know, like plotting because obviously I have nothing wrong with like you know slower paced a deliberately slower paced on um, character driven books that are more about the journey through life with many different um interlinked subplots but like when this is a, a romance novel and only like you know 300 odd pages you don't really have the luxury of time for that you just need to have like a bang 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 like more of a plot um centric book and so I will um I had to pull up the synopsis from Amazon because guess what someone yet again from the library covered up part of it with a sticker I just I hate when they do that so here it is um a sweeping love story set in a lavish seaside mansion in 1901 Rhode Island Melinda Hollister is a society lady intent on finding a rich husband before her peers discover her quickly diminishing wealth. Nick Bryson is all business, focused on making a name for himself in his father's steamship line. Oh, they did a, a misspelling in the Amazon synopsis. They wrote teamship instead of steamship. Despite the marriage of their siblings, they rarely give each other gave each other a second glance until a tragic accident results in Melinda and Nick being appointed as co-guardians of their three-year-old niece, Nell, who is um, four years old by the time the meat of this story begins. In order to get better acquainted with Nell and one another, Melinda and Nick agree to spend the summer in their own private quarters of the Bryson family vacation home, Summerhill. As their love for Nell grows, so does their attraction to each other. And for the first time in their lives, they sense that God has a bigger plan in motion. Yet old habits die hard, and Melinda and Nick each find it difficult to resist the pull of their former worlds. When the unthinkable happens, they find themselves faced with seemingly impossible choices and a new understanding of God's true love. And um, Melinda's father, like before the story began, he had lost his fortune. And of course, you know, back in those days, this was a huge um, scandal. They were shunned by like so-called like, you know, respectable society, the infamous um, 400 on um, Mrs asters you know like do not do not not to do not call but like the do call list like and everyone who wasn't on the 400 was just basically you know pawn scum in their eyes even if they had a lot of money and so like he worked the father worked to build the fortune back up and then they were admitted back into society although like from a modern point it seems why would you want people who like snubbed you and were treated you like absolute garbage to welcome you back warmly into their good graces just because you have money again you remember the ugly true colors they showed when you treated you like you were nothing just because you didn't have as many millions in the bank as they did and then by the time the book opens and Melinda's father has died and there's financial trouble in the family again and her, her mother is having a hard time she realizes she has to let go of almost all of the servants and sell their bombastic fifth avenue mansion to move to a, I would believe it's on Waverly Place, a much smaller house with only like maybe like two servants or so. And this is, a, again, a huge scandal and they don't want people to find this out. Or if they do find it out, it can't, you know, happen until after Melinda has properly married because if they know she's like lost her family fortune, there goes her chance of finding a husband. Like, I mean, I know it sounds like in the modern era, how could people act like this or just accept it? But that really 
was like it or not how rich society ordered itself at this time if you didn't have like the right social connections or you didn't have enough money or you didn't marry so-called like properly or whatever you just didn't do this or that or didn't like march and walk step with the hoity-toity um rich crowd they would just like throw you out and there would be a huge scandal and women wouldn't be able to find a good marriage or like the children growing up they wouldn't be maybe accepted into like Groton the a snob school a private school for boys in Connecticut or make good marriages or get like accepted into Harvard or like someone's law firm or whatever so this really really was a big deal particularly for a woman because in those days well I mean obviously it was a little bit different it's always has been for like working class women and even some lower middle class women but if you were a rich woman like you didn't really have a name beyond your husband's name you were like socially and legally known as Mrs. Husband's full name you didn't even get identified as your own actual name so basically like your identity your success in life it all hinged on who your husband was and, and so Melinda really has to like amp up her search for a good husband and she's 23 by the time the need of the book begins there's a brief epilogue not an epilogue a prologue where um, Melinda and Nick are like in the office and they realize to their shock their um re their respective um deceased siblings who were married have left them as co-guardians of their little niece Nell and they can't believe it like oh I want her full-time no I want her like oh I'm a woman I'll provide a loving mother's touch and you're a man and you're like out working all the time and you're abroad for business and different parts of America so much of the year how can you provide a stable home and he's like oh oh I have all the family money and her last name is Bryson too and she has to say with our family and just I can give her so many more advantages you can and you know, like this and that and then they her mother decide Melinda's mother decides like maybe you should go to Summerhill to like stay with Nell and give her a little bit of stability before she goes to Nick for the second half of the year the she had longer in Melinda's custody because Nick was abroad on business for the family's um steamship line not the team ship line and so like basically they just feel it would like help to transition her better to living like full not full time just like half of the year the shared custody with Nick and then obviously they start like falling for one another a little bit but there are also a couple of other potential suitors Melinda has her eye on or more likely who have their eye on Melinda and she just really it's not like clicking 100% with all of them like oh this guy's a, a philatelist a stamp collector and he only tolerates children so how would my niece deal with him and oh he wants me to move to Pittsburgh and this dude owns a cattle ranch and this is like a dude in his 40s he's like you know 10 12 kids and he's a widower and I really don't like this dude he's kind of like a shady rake I just don't like his attitude and then she realizes she's genuinely growing closer to Nick and Nick is glowing glow growing closer to her as well and then all this and that and all of course like obviously you can read the book to find out the little bit of drama and I just felt that kind of took up a little bit too much time and obviously the plot itself seemed kind of shallow at first obviously it does as I said begin ramping up a lot in the last hundred or so pages but like like the the plots of the first two books where the one was like love on a dime the woman I'm Lily who writes dime novels is Fanny Cole she has this huge dilemma beyond like choosing which man she's going to marry her um, long lost sweetheart who finally came back after he made a fortune or the like so-called like polite respectable dude from a well-connected family who's been courting her and as well she doesn't want her family to find out she's been writing <gasps> dime novels instead of like you know even like you know high class literature but for a woman to write any kind of literature in that era like you know if, particularly for a rich woman that was just like a, would be a total like society scandal even though she's writing her dime novels with like you know Christian like values instead of just like you know tawdry like you know bodice rippers and stuff like that and so that's like a really you know big dilemma like well oh what will do I do if my family finds out and this guy from a nasty tabloid newspaper is blackmailing me to expose my real name and I don't feel able to confide in I'm Jack the long lost love who came back who's like trying to buy her own publishing company and like help her out she's trying to do it all by herself but in the second book I'm love on assignment Charlotte is also working for a newspaper and she's um sent to work as a governess for and not an older like I guess like the 33 I would guess his age he seems about in his early 30s and he has um two children and he's like writing really radical editorials for a local newspaper and he's also teaching at the local bible college and she's like trying to dig up dirt on him because her boss at the newspaper wants to destroy him and she's finding no dirt and then she's like 
realizing she's falling more and more in love with him. Daniel, the guy she's working for, and like, he's a really genuine bloke, and she loves his kids, and she just can't find anything negative, and her boss is saying, oh, we'll plant dirt, and like she's just trying to, oh, should I confess to Daniel what I've been doing and hurt him, or should I just like leave it in the past or just like run away and let him think like something else happened and she's also like genuinely growing in her like religious faith th thanks to the influence of Daniel and his children so those are like you know real like moral dilemmas and quandaries and g really really good plots in the first two books and the second it just seems like oh a shallow woman who used to be kind of rich and has lost a lot of fortune now she has to find a husband and avoid like society scandal it's kind of you know boring I mean not that it couldn't be done well it just seemed like it wasn't very like it compelling at first and so that's why I just kept putting the book aside and then it finally starts kind of like getting a lot more interesting and I, this is a kind of spoiler-ish thing so you can like like mute it now or whatever so it, it doesn't spoil the whole book is what I'm trying to say that Melinda and Nick actually end up getting married about halfway through the book but they do not consummate the marriage so that's like totally not like a normal romance novel at all usually it ends like at the wedding or like you know shortly before the wedding or like shortly after words so it's not like oh they're married already and like la 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 happy ever after because you know they they still don't fully love one another and they have to start growing more connected and then Melinda finds out um Nick well she realized like obviously Nick knew this too it was that wasn't like a surprise or a shock they married primarily because of Nell like they didn't want her to like go away to a stranger if Melinda had a new husband an, an a husband and he became Nell's stepfather and like just Nick wanted her to have the stability of a home and they knew that and then Melinda finds out thanks to her oh I hated this dude he was a terrible oh, no, like oh not a terrible villain but a very well written villain the evil brother-in-law Jasper is saying oh but the, by the way I'm um, Nick only married you because he found out you lost your family fortune again and he felt sorry for you and like they had been starting to grow really close at this time and like Melinda feels like wow he's using me like and no one likes that feeling like a like someone just befriended you or married you because they felt sorry for you not because they like they genuinely liked you and or, or even if you know a good arranged marriage like many people they grow in love over time but but they and they at least start out with like some kind of mutual attraction and friendship and then that that kind of sets the relationship back at square one there's also a bunch of drama with um Nick's father um Frederick is losing his mind he's having dementia he's like trying to pit um Nick and Jasper against one another and constantly forgetting what he's doing or what he had promised even like earlier in that day and they're trying to buy a new um steamship line so they can make even more money although of course like looking back a hundred plus years later you realize that maybe they're gonna lose their fortune in like you know 20 a couple of decades because like steamships who like takes a steamship anymore even like uh, after like uh, I would say like the 20s or 30s or so like people just weren't weren't using them nearly as often as they were early in the decade like planes were starting to become more common and stuff like that and like just who travels by a ship anymore and obviously always well that's a whole other thing so that does make it sound like it would be a lot better and I do wish the author had like kind of like amped up those things and made them more prominent instead of like spending like a hundred plus pages on the oh who should I marry oh I'm afraid they're gonna find out they're I've lost my fortune and like oh should I marry Nick or should I just hold out for someone else I like even more and oh oh I'm a spinster already at 23 and also there's a one of the subplots is about like Melinda is always been very like shallow she loves like pretty baubles and buying things I didn't realize this and the that era many rich women they didn't even ask the price when they went to a store they were just that was considered like low bread like oh oh don't even think about your budget or like what your husband lets you buy I'll just like buy whatever you like and what you see now that attracts your eye and oh just like worry about it later or don't even think about it because you're supposed to go through millions of bucks like it's you know water or candy and then there's again another subplot there her a couple um Glenna and Stephen are they're missionaries in Africa and they've um come back to um Rhode Island um, um Newport Rhode Island if you didn't know many um rich um swells had like summer homes in there for many many years they call them cottages even though these were most of them were like huge bombastic mansions they, the exact opposite of what I would consider a cottage and like Glenna helps Melinda to grow a little bit in her faith but that's another complaint I had about this book the religion aspect seems kind of like tacked on and almost there and like again in the first two books there were like some serious moral 
dilemmas for the characters and also like in the first book I'm um, Jack and then the second book Charlotte they were like genuinely like growing in their faith over time and this one it just seems like oh they're praying every so often oh god help me to help me make up my mind and show the way for me to do and make me realize like oh I'm really doing the right thing or if I sh should do something else instead and, and it just it seemed like you know not really as strongly like incorporated with the material as in the first two books but again that's not necessarily anything wrong with like the way the characters are praying but it just seemed like if you're gonna do like Christian um historical romance you should at least feature it more prominently instead of oh or I'm just gonna pray from time to time and now I'm like realizing I need to become less um selfish and not sell things to help my friends the missionaries make money and like put off buying a summer cottage that would cost a lot of money because oh no I'm really changing my ways it just didn't feel like as genuine or gradual or like well incorporated as I said with the overall plot line as it did in the first book and then it really starts getting good in the last hundred pages I as I said I don't want to give anything away but oh there's like lots of drama with them Jasper and there's a couple of the servants too and just like Nick and Melinda are like genuinely growing like closer to one another but they still haven't consummated their marriage and the father is like losing his mind and there's like some really really like awful drama happening in Newport and Nick is called back when he's been in New York trying to buy the rival on the steamship line the blue star line I don't like that's probably fictional but a play on the white star line but the author does mention like other real life steamship companies like I'm um, white star and Cunard or Cunard I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that so like it really really is a good book if you like stick with it although I do realize some people oh if it's not catching my attention or it's boring within the first hundred pages just um you know put it down but I really really did um enjoy this book and some people said they didn't like it but at the end like they were implying there was a sex scene in it I mean I obviously have no problem with like reading or writing sex scenes but like if that's a kind of thing that makes you like squeamish or something there's no sex scene in the book like thinking about wanting to have sex and like talking about like let's like have sex or whatever that's like completely different than actually showing a graphic sex scene so there's no worry if you like your romances sweet there is absolutely like zero like sex stuff in this book that it only does you like first base and like talking about some tingly feeling so and I really I, I recommend the first two books in this um trilogy much higher than this book but this book did really turn out to pleasantly surprise me I just you know had to you know stay with it and it kept going and getting better and better and better the longer I read it and I am also hoping maybe I can read some more of the uh, Ms. Um, James's um, future of her other book she's written in at, and just like the previous books they also have um, a, a reading group guide in the back so if you're like reading this with a group or maybe if you just like want to like write this down in a journal for yourself or something so here are some of the examples um when Melinda was a teenager her father lost his fortune even though he regained it she was deeply affected by the experience how do you think that traumatic event influenced her future do you think that justifies her plan to marry for reasons other than love Melinda and Nick had different ways of expressing love. Do you think men and women often tend to show their love for each other differently? Or do you think it just depends on the individual? In what ways did money or the lack of it influence the behavior of both the servants and the cottagers? Do you think Melinda and Nick should have married for Nell's sake even though they weren't in love? Do you think people ever marry or stay together for the children's welfare in the 21st century? Is it a good idea? And just uh, I I cannot recommend this um trilogy highly enough by the author. Even though as I sound like a broken record, I much much did prefer the first two books. And so um thank you guys very much for watching. And um, please um leave a comment. I love like having conversations with you guys. And um I will see you again very soon. Thanks again for watching. Bye.